Third Shift presents The Imposter's Guide to Gaming, your quick fix for gaming news. Now, here are your hosts, Eric and Matt. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to IG2G, this is episode 59. I, of course, am your host, the greatest man who's ever lived. It's me, it's Matt. With me, as always, it's my buddy, Eric Lightbringer. What we got up in the releases, I'm going to give you a teaser. I got three things that I love in the releases. Eric's talking about two other things. I have no idea what they are. Then we're talking all about connections and getting together and like, oh man, can I reach out? Can you reach out and touch someone? Can you not? Should you be able to? Will you be able to in the future? That's a tease right there. Oh my goodness. So let's get right into it. Here's the intro thing. Do, 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 do releases. Number five. So first up in my three-pack of things that I love, we've got a developer that is continuing to add stuff to their game post-release, continuing to improve the play experience, add new things for the players, things that people want in their game. That's what is going on right here. I'm talking about No Man's Sky Beyond, the latest free content update for the original No Man's Sky. This came out on the 14th of August for PC, PS4, and Xbox One from the developers over there at Hello Games. They, they, took, they took a pounding when No Man's Sky first came out. But as with the last update, No Man's Sky Next, Beyond here adds all kinds of good, crazy stuff. I mean, all the stuff that you know everybody wanted when No Man's Sky first came in, a bunch more of that stuff is in here, including improved multiplayer. Now, they've, they've added like a social hub that players can you know meet up in and, and, and chat around with before going into the game. That's now updated to 16 players in that hub. And you can have an eight, like in your universe, you can have concurrently eight players in the same game on console and 32 in the same game on PC. Which, if you add that on top of the increased base building, the new skill trees, the new options for like everything. Like if I went through all the patch notes, I would be here all night. There's so much new stuff in here. In addition to new patch notes and new things, so that's that's like one like one like little side thing. Another thing they've added now: if you are one of those rich people who has one of those big setups, now there's VR support for No Man's Sky, so you can immerse yourself even more in this this wild, faraway galaxy with all these you know unique planets and creatures and all that stuff. If you want to feel like you're walking around on that new planet, you can do it now in VR. The only downside I've heard of that is that in PSVR textures from more than a few feet away from your character they get really really blurry but you know what just internalize that as part of the experience you're on this new planet and it's got this this thick soupy atmosphere so you can't see too far into the distance there you go that's perfect that's how you do it but if you do you know if you do have that setup i've heard that the vr experience is actually really good it's really immersive when you're using the move controllers out you know, as your as your hands and out on foot, it's a really good experience. People have said the move controller stuff for PSVR is not that great when you're flying your ship, but anything else, you know, just exploring, doing all that stuff, people are loving that. Another cool thing that I haven't heard much about, I've only heard it like mentioned in reviews, is now I'm assuming this is mostly on the PC end than the console end. There's now a programming option, so you can make your own systems and things in the game. The one example that I've seen of it is that Hello Games has got a working version of Rocket League in No Man's Sky. So I don't know if they're trying to like build into like you know the game creation tools, like something like Dreams. But if you can make something like Rocket League in No in No Man's Sky with this programming tool, that sounds pretty awesome. So in addition to all the awesome stuff that's procedurally generated in the original No Man's Sky, all the stuff they've added here. Now, if you're getting into a programming option where the users can create their own content and own unique things, that's just even that's just even crazier and even more cool. So if you still got your No Man's Sky, if you still want to dip your toes back into it, if you still want to have that that big experience of exploring the galaxy with or without your friends, this is just another awesome update to it. Like you can ride animals, you can harvest animals, you can farm, you can do all, you could do so many things in this game now that again, people thought they'd be able to do in the launch version. But look, the developers weren't lying. Now you can do it here. If you're interested in No Man's Sky Beyond, definitely check out the patch notes cuz there's there's so much more stuff that I couldn't possibly get into. As I said, I'd be here all night. All kinds of additions, NPCs, tech trees, quali- just so many quality of life improvements 
that just make the experience smoother, make it feel more like an actual world, you know, a universe that you're living in, definitely check out the patch notes. Check out No Man's Sky Beyond. If you got your No Man's Sky, it's free. It's 100% free. Just download it and get in there and have yourself a great time exploring the universe. Number four. First up for my releases, I've got a cute, fun, silly little title called Gravity Ghost Deluxe Edition. It was released August 6, 2019 on the PlayStation 4. It's already available on the PC. This game is a neat, short, two, three hour adventure in which you are this little ghost girl named Iona and you have lost your friend the fox and you're going to go on this cool gravity type weird adventure to find said friend along the way you're going to be solving tons of puzzles and doing weird little things all all using gravity mind you so you go level to level and inside this you'll be like falling but when you get around these planets and stuff you can do like weird things with the gravity bounce off of them sometimes break through them all sorts of cool puzzle elements going on and the whole time you're trying to friend find your friend the fox but along the way you're going to find these other animals and then you'll get them into your hair which kind of floats behind you and you can tag them along and then you'll find their bones and you reunite the animal spirit with its bones and of course you'll do this over and over solving the puzzles finding stars using gravity and physics to solve said puzzles and you'll do this for two to three hours or so. Beautiful music, uh, great voice casting. You got Ashley Birch in there and a few others. So if you want something that's real chill, laid back, you're floating around in the cosmos, going from episode to episode or level to level, however you want to call it, and have fun using gravity and physics to solve puzzles and figure ways out through the level to get through the doorways or get the stars, etc., necessary to open said doors, this might be something for you to check out. It's an awesome, cool little title. Number three. So number two on my list of things that I really love. If you know anything about me, you know I love cheesy, over-the-top, ridiculous goofatronics. I love like silly, like crazy, over-the-top, silly stuff. And that's what Metal Wolf Chaos XD is. This dropped on the 6th of August, so technically it could have gone on last week's show, but now it's on this week's show. For 25 bucks for PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Originally developed by From Software. Oh my goodness, you're saying, how could the Dark Souls developers do something silly? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Published by Devolver Digital. This is where I'm getting into it right now. <laughs> this is basically just an not a not a remastering, but this is like a, a an HDified version of a Japanese original Xbox exclusive from like 15 years ago from 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 software back when they were really only known for the Armored Core series. And I even I had to be reminded that they used to do Armored Core because you hear from software and you just think Dark Souls, Demon Souls, hard ass games, and I don't want to play them. This is just just a miserable experience. But they did used to make really cool mech games where you could put you know missile pods on and rocket pods and guns and stuff and walk around as a big mech here you do that yes you do do that but this is kind of a an over-the-top ridiculous uh, like crazy alternative alternate america near future ridiculousness parody of a normal mech game because what happens in this game you are the president of the united states any game where you can play as the president that's awesome saints world 4 did it this does it too but in this one a military coup happens is is thrown is thrust upon you as the president <laughs> and you you are ousted so you have to hop in your super secret badass giant mech and go across the country taking you know taking out the resistance taking back your country from who all from the villainous vice president who took over the country in a giant mech suit so if you like over the top ridiculousness you're gonna like this i mean everything i've seen from the cutscenes and everything is so over the top and like I can't I can't say over the top enough. If this was a video, we'd have over the top counter and we'd go ping 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 every time I say it. But all the cutscenes I've seen are like they're they're over the top. I can't I can't say it any other way. I know it sounds horrible, but like there's there's a cutscene I've seen where you're out in space somehow, you're like falling back to earth, you grab a giant chunk of metal from the space station you just blew up and you you're surfing through the atmosphere back to the planet. That's the kind of game this is. And in addition to that, I, 
in addition to that, Devolver Digital for this new version has put on some some very che- cheesemous voice acting. Like if you're thinking of Earth Defense Force, which you should, because that's another cheesy, over the top thing that I love. Think of that kind of voice acting, where it's it's intentionally kind of bad and cheesy, but that fits the tone of the game, where it's this. It's just a ridiculous story. The voice acting matches the ridiculousness. The the cutscene direction matches the ridiculousness of it. Now, if you if you want to be like a, you know put on your serious reviewer hat, say well the graphics aren't very good because it's just an HDification of an old Xbox One game from 15 years ago, and the controls are a little stilted. You know the systems don't quite work like they should. But we've had 15 years to get better at things and make things smooth. Where this is from the original Xbox. Now. I will say, I, I was sold from just the trailers alone and the cheesy voice acting, and you're the president piloting a mech to save America from another mech piloting vice president. If you go on the Wikipedia page for this game, there's all kinds of backstory and details about the development of it and like the mindset of the developers who were put in charge of making it. Like Obviously, it's, it's for the Xbox. We, the game was commissioned by Microsoft, so they kind of had an American theme to it. They wanted it to, to, they wanted to take that throughout the game. But then, like their mindset of, this is kind of America as Japanese view it from like stories we've heard about it. Kind of like if you put ninjas in an American movie, what are they? They're like super powered, super secret badasses. They're you know magical. They're they're crazy over the top. Well, this is like American, big, loud, save save the world, freedom, big giant mechs, punching things, explosions, all that kind of you know armies all over the smashing each other together. It's if something about that really resonated with me when I saw that. Like this is at the time Japanese people's view of America via the pop culture that they get. Because I mean, we we do the same thing. Like I said with ninjas, when they romanticize them in their pop culture, we kind of like take that and internalize it and put our own spin on it. That's what they did with this game. So reading that made me like go, wow, wow, that's totally cool. And then on top of it, it looks like cheesy, ridiculous fun. You know, I love that. You know, I'm gonna love Metal Wolf Chaos. If you like. Earth Defense Force, if you like, maybe stuff like Vanquish that was pretty cheesy and over-the-top, even though it had super tight controls and looked super fresh. If you like cheesy, over-the-top fun, like any of those games or anything of that ilk, of that 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 style, get yourself Metal Wolf Chaos XD. My boys at Devolver Digital, they're at it again. They, made a, they published another game that I gotta have and I want on my console. They're the best. That's awesome. Metal Wolf Chaos XD, do it. Number two. I've been waiting for this particular title to come out for quite some time. I really want to get it. I'm bogged down deep into the games that I'm playing right now, but I feel like I'm going to have to pick this one up. It's Grandia, the HD collection for the Nintendo Switch. It is out as of this moment, so you can go purchase it at your leisure. And this collection kind of kind of is weird because it says it's an HD collection, but it only has... Grandia 1 and Grandia 2 in it. And of course there were several other Grandias, but they're not there. Which I found a little bit weird, but whatever. The only important piece of this news is that Grandia 2 is in this. If you don't know what these titles are, they're old school RPGs. Grandia was for the PlayStation 1 and Grandia 2 was for the Dreamcast. And then of course brought over to the PlayStation 2 as well. Um, So, I played Grandia 2 first on the Dreamcast. And it blew my mind. The graphics at the time, the landscapes and environments were fantastic, colorful, beautiful. The story was super engaging. You're a mercenary, Ryudo. You get uh, sent on a job to protect a priestess. You think it's just a cut, run, dry job. Turns out, oh my goodness, the evil epic bad guy who's like the devil is coming to get her, wants to create some sort of apocalypse. You get dragged into stopping it because, of course, your job is to protect her. And everything starts to go down. You start to get relationships, meet other people that help you along the way. Really fun story. Really engaging. It's cool because Ryoto isn't like you're just young little, you know, I'm a little adventurer. Yay! You know, he's more uh, witty, more adultish. So very cool from that point of view. It is, of course, the run of mill kind of story overall. But the way you get to it, it's really neat. It is an old school JRPG. There are random encounters, uh, lots of you know overarching maps going from here to there, here to there, and then of course the the best part about this is the combat. Instead of it just being simple turn based, 
your everyone runs on a meter, you and the enemies, and you'll see it down in the right hand screen and they you race across and then you'll get to these action points in which you can engage the enemy with different attacks, magic, etc. And depending on the attacks you use, you can stun or slow down the enemy's timer to when they can attack. So a lot of strategy comes into play on both ends where they're trying to hit you or they hit your healers and they're stunning the healer so the healer can't go, can't heal anybody, that can create a problem. So you want to make sure you're getting people that do the big hits and stun them and keep them from attacking and or you know hindering you. It's, it's just a really neat play on the RPG that I found awesome at the time and it still holds up today. And you don't see very many games doing this kind of thing anymore. In fact, you just don't see a lot of RPGs you know, old school RPGs anyway, at all. They're coming back, but hey, you know, we got to keep pushing for them. I definitely recommend this title if you have an affinity, a love for old school RPGs. It's great. Now, Grandia 1, it's more of a classic JRPG. You're, uh, I think his name was Justin, and he's just a little pipsqueak, wants to be an adventurer, gets caught up in this whole epic thing, and off you go on a Grand Ois adventure. Your typical RPG... But still, very colorful, set in the same world that Grounded 2's in, obviously, because they, uh, they were going for, you know, a whole shtick. You know, they were going to continue on a whole bunch of series and keep going with it. But it's fun for what it is. As I said, it's the HD collection, so they took the graphics of both, and they kind of jumped them up and smoothed them out as best they could. Grounded 2 definitely looks a lot better for it than Grounded uh, the original does. But there's only so much you can do with a, you know, very old PlayStation 1 game, unless you just do a straight-on remake. I definitely recommend these titles for anybody who love RPGs, especially old school RPGs. If not, maybe wait for it to be in a bargain bin or just go watch a couple videos and take a peek for yourself. But I would definitely put Grandia 2, at least in my books, as one of my top 10 favorite RPGs of all time. So hey, there you go. You know I love my RPGs. I definitely recommend you at least take a peek. Number 1 so last but not least, on my three-pack of things that I love, you know I love indie games. I'm the indie game guy on the show. I love indie games. I love the old-school pixel art style. I love chiptune music. I love just old-school indie game puzzling and platforming, and I also love narrative stuff. And this, this whirls that all together in a blender. This is a game called Horus that was out for PC. Now, this isn't, this isn't really a release. This is a post-release topic of discussion i guess because this came out on the 18th of july i believe it's only available for pc right now i'm really hoping it comes to a console or something in the future but this is developed by two dudes paul hellman and sean scalpelhorn scalp scalpelhorn is that a real name that's not a real name it can't be nobody's named scalpelhorn but published by 505 games this is a game all about playing as a robot who is created and kind of you know comes to life and wants to be part of the family and then something terrible happens and he gets shut down for a while and then when he wakes back up in the future the family has all you know scattered to the four corners of the earth he's got to find him he's got to figure out what's going on what happened and then he wants to find the family again because he wants to become human think of something like bicentennial man you know you you're created you come to love the family and then you you carry on into the future with this character You know, I mentioned narrative before. This is a very, very story-driven game from all accounts that I've heard. Again, it's since I'm so interested in it, I don't want to spoil anything of it for myself. But I've heard that, you know, there's tons and tons and tons of cutscenes in here and, you know, story beats. And then you'll have like a platforming segment where you're going from, you know, point A to point B. And when you get to B, you got more story scenes. And I love story. And from everything I've heard, this this story is not only, you know, emotionally effective, but then it's also told in a really funny way. So the, f- the very first comparison I saw about this game, which made me click on the link, was, oh man, Horus is kind of just like Earthbound, or it reminds me a lot of Earthbound. Anytime you say, reminds me of Earthbound, I have to click on it and find out what it is. And this this looks like one that I'm I'm so glad that I found because I didn't want to miss it and just never play it. But definitely check out the trailer. You know, I check out the the release trailer and there's there's a <laughs> there's a joke in there that I totally missed the first time and I had to watch it again before I got it because I was I was in the mood for like story heaviness and you know emotional themes. But that joke is right at the beginning and. I going back and watching it right before I recorded this I went oh my god I totally get it now so it again it's it's an emotional story about this robot and his family and what's become of them and how he's trying to reconnect with them 
but also sprinkled throughout are all kinds of pop culture references, references to 80s and 90s things. Now, the the one thing I'm a little I'm a little scared of is I've heard that there's a lot of like British themed things, and you can kind of tell that it's a British theme just by the robot's voice, which I'll get into in a second. But if you are a British person and you have not played this game, you're probably going to like it if you like retro style things, because there's all kinds of British, you know, references to British TV shows and TV show hosts and actors and things like that. But from what I've seen so far, there's, there's, you know, some general pop culture jokes that everybody can get. And on top of that, there's a ton of retro game references. Now, I've, I know I've seen some British reviewers saying, oh, there's a reference to the old ZX Spectrum game. And I'm like, whoa, I never played that because I'm an American, son. But then there's also, ref- you know, a lot of retro game-inspired minigames in here. Like, uh, if you watch the trailer, you can see them playing OutRun or like something like Ski Free. Kind of a lot of retro game influences. So if you've been a gamer for a long time, you're going to get a lot out of the references in this game too. There's a lot of rhythm game sections from what I've heard where you're you know completing a task. Whether it's stamping some boxes that are going down a conveyor belt, there's a, a scene in the tra- in It wasn't in a trailer, it was in a review I saw where you're, you're basically playing the... Uh, the guitar mini game from the Back to the Future NES game from LJN. Something was coming at, you know, Horace as he was trying to do whatever it was because it wasn't explained. It was just a scene I saw. Where at Back to the Future, you're catching the notes with the guitar. Here he was catching other things with another thing, but it looked the exact same. He was in the dead center of the screen, and you go up, middle, and down, and turn from side to side. It just, it just, it, it, it bubbled to the surface. All these cheery feelings when I saw all these retro game mini game influences and then if you get to the actual gameplay it is like a hard as nails platforming game <laughs> like in some of the trailers the first bit you see is him walking through town and running around and it's like wow the graphics are so cute you know the chiptune stuff sounds so nice but then it starts cutting into later in the game and it's like holy crap it's looking like mario maker 2 sadistic levels of platforming is what it looks like so my brain was like oh no holy goodness now i've heard that the, the difficult platforming stuff, it kind of eases you into it as it goes along. You get like gravity boots where you can walk along walls and then it flips gravity to that wall. So I hear it does a ton of interesting stuff with that. You're getting into like Mario Galaxy type things where you jump off of this wall to connect to, you know, this piece that's in the air and then that rotates the whole world. You know, it's stuff like if you're, if, if gravity is upside down and you jump up, through you could fall out into space if you've played something like v v v v v v i don't remember how many v's there were in that one or super mario galaxy you know the kind of like gravity manipulation stuff i'm talking about it looks really cool looks really crazy i've heard the platforming gets really really hard later on but they do have like a shield mechanic in the game where you can take a few extra hits if you have the shield around you and if you die a lot it'll add more shields to like the start of the level there but I've heard there's no like you know there's no easy mode there's no difficulty setting or slider so you just have to kind of get good at the game. But I've heard that most of the challenges are timing based too. So once you get the timing down, maybe you can make it through these really difficult segments. Uh, hopefully, because I really want to play it and I really want to get <laughs> through the story and not get stuck by these difficult platforming segments. But the game also looks incredibly beautiful. Like it. When you look at that first gameplay reveal trailer, like it starts off super zoomed in on the characters, and you're like, oh my god, it's so many big, giant pixels. It looks ridiculous. But when you watch the game in action, the camera kind of zooms out, so it is pixel art, but it, it blends together so well, it looks really fluid and really beautiful in motion. And then the soundtrack, again, really great chiptune stuff. The only annoyance I've heard people talk about on the soundtrack, or the sound side of things, not the soundtrack is that since you are a robot and Horace narrates the entire game, so any kind of cutscene, it's him talking about what this character said. And he's basically telling you the story of what it is he went and did or what he went through. It's all his voice and everything he narrates is done in a text-to-speech style, so it definitely has the robot sound to it. And people said that's kind of unnerving to them after listening to it for a long while. I think it really kind of... It really, it really fits. A because he looks like a, a not that detailed kind of a robot. Y- you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about when you see a screenshot of the game. But then it also has like a, this text to speech software or pattern or whatever it is they use. It's got a definite British theme to it. 
like if you if you listen to it, it's got a little bit of a British accent. So that fits in with all the British pop culture references you're going to be getting, all the British game references and things. So I'm kind of all over the place with talking about Horus because, but I am really excited about it, and I just you know I kind of put myself in a little bit of blackout because you know how I am. I don't want stories ruined for me. I don't want things spoiled. So if a funny, heartwarming, narratively driven, hard as nails indie platformer with retro graphics and a chiptune soundtrack sounds like it's up your alley like it's not all those things i love all those things it says it's up my alley so i'm gonna play horus if you missed out on getting horus i mean heck it came out almost a month ago so it's probably on like a hundred hundred and ninety five percent off sale on steam by now because that's how steam works right you can get it for super cheap on steam again i haven't heard if it's coming to consoles if it's already on consoles the only thing i found was the steam page and stuff about hey it's on now it's out now for pc so definitely go check out horus if you're in the mood for any of that good stuff i've been talking about in the past 10 minutes check it out it's horus have yourself a good time Imposter topic of the day. Topic today, everybody, is kind of like a, it's like a little piece of clay and another little piece of clay and another little piece of clay. And you start putting all these pieces of clay together and you start to make something, all right? So I wanted to just kind of blend a little bit of everything together to kind of get a bigger picture of what's going on in the video game industry. What am I talking about, you ask? What? Well, here we go. We'll start this off at this point. Today, earlier today or tomorrow or yesterday for you guys, it doesn't matter. Time's crazy. The Switch, Nintendo themselves, said, hey, guess what, everybody? You can now use Xbox One controllers for the Nintendo Switch. Mm -hmm. Hey, how about you link it up and give it a try? And I went, holy crap, that's freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking, oh, yeah, that's right. They did the Xbox Live thing they've got going here. Mm -hmm. They got Cuphead over. Ori in the Blind Forest, if you didn't know, was just announced that Gamescon is coming over. And there's some others that Xbox has been kind of sharing and hanging out a little bit with Nintendo. Nintendo's hanging out and doing a little sharing with Xbox. So you're seeing these two big juggernauts working together recently and playing nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, then on top of that, you got the cross save thing going on. Destiny's getting the cross saves. You got Fortnite, obviously, kind of pushed away. You've got, um, what's that one with the cars that used to play all the time? Rocket League. Hey, I talked about that in the releases. I said Rocket League there, too. Bing, bang. (laughs) Oh, bringing it all in. That's what I'm talking about. And then several others. Oh, the Call of Duty that's coming out is going to be cross play. Oh, nice. You're seeing the cross play action coming in here. So, here we are. All right. Stadia is coming in. Stadia is going to be like an overarching thing. It's getting games from all over the place. You know, whatever it can get, it's taking, mm-hmm. and that's going to be like you're going to, be able to play on laptops. You're going to, be able to play on tablets, phones, for goodness sakes, anything that's got a, a browser. You're going to be able to play the Stadia on. And then you got Sony, you know, hanging out in the background. They're still getting their exclusives. If you didn't know, they just picked up Insomniac as a developer. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be hoarding all these guys and all their other individuals they got and developers they got in their pocket. Not really playing nice. Well, the other two are. But the cross-save and cross-play is starting to, like, merge into everything. So overarching, Matt, here. What do you think, first off, of the Nintendo and the Xbox scenario? And then we'll move on to just an overarching little conversation about what the hell is going to happen here in the next few years. Well, I think it's I think the the Nintendo Xbox like kind of kind of hand holding hand in hand thing. I think it's it's good. I mean, obviously, anything kind of cross play, cross platform, any companies working together instead of being rivals is good. Do you think it might be a move on their part to try to get the upper hand on PlayStation, who's been ruling the roost for the last six seven years? Yeah, I mean. I, I was debating whether or not to say, well, you know, Sony's kind of in the lead because that's just my preconceived. My well, they, they are in the lead by a large margin. Uh, well, then it just makes sense if you're the two dogs. I'm not going to say like in the back of the pack, but, you know, if you're trailing the leader, why wouldn't you work together to get, to gain mutual success and get pieces of what that is? And, I mean, it's just it's just smart and it's a good idea because it, it, there's no downfall to it that I see. Oh, man, gee, they can interact with each other now. All two companies working together to trade games or trade services. It it always it works out in the end for the consumer, I think. For the consumer, I think it works great. Here's mm-hmm. the thing though, and this is what everybody's talking about is 
if these two start playing together and they start exchanging games and going back and forth, then they kind of become one because whatever games you can get on, say, say in the near future, Nintendo actually starts giving a couple of its Nintendo exclusives and lets Microsoft touch any of that. No, which that's, that's I, never going to happen. Don't, you don't you see how? Okay, yeah. so here, but here's the scuttlebutt: is that what if they do? Not like maybe they're big, big ones, but some of their tertiary, like Mario Rabbids kind of deals, things like that. Mm. Let that like Microsoft start having some of that. And then you start blending these games and these titles together. I feel like you can do that, and I, that's that's the level that I see actual game trading or you know series going on with this. But I mean, you can't. I mean, a you can't really just like, oh look, poof, now it's on our service now. Like you have to get the people to program it for your console, the way it works, all that jazz. Even if it's digital only, you can't just be like, oh look, now it's on the store with no, it's, yeah, with it's no not effort. Magic. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it does it does take effort to do it. I think that would be the level that we see. It would be like Mario and Rabbids two years after it launches on Switch. Oh, look, hey, we got a cool port for Xbox. If this was to happen, I think that's the level you're going to see. So, with that being said, with there not being, you know, first pers- you know first party Mario game, Mario Odyssey, that will never be on Xbox. It'll only be on Switch things. It'll only be on Nintendo systems because you can't give away your cash cow like that's your baby that's what will sell your system you can't ever give that away but i think that if you are you know trading the lesser known things it you can still do it if it's with enough of a delay like if you if you really wanted to play cuphead you bought an xbox one when it was out i mean now it came to switch sure but it's it's past the point where it's going to move units for your competitor even though you're friends you know what i'm saying uh-huh. I know what you're saying, and in in our current mindset, you're right. Nobody plays nice. Everybody hoards their titles and keeps their titles, and and then this is an artificial friendship, basically, mm-hmm. and handing out crappy titles that aren't that important to the to the other one to keep this little hey, we're ganging up on Sony thing. Mm-hmm. But see, I think it's going to go deeper because Microsoft and Nintendo, Nintendo bo- both respectively are rich because mm-hmm. both of them respectively have their own markets in which they dominate in. So there's, it's not like they're falling behind a Sony, like as in monetary value, right. but in the gaming war, yes, yeah, Sony's way ahead. I really do think that they're going to push forward, and you're going to start to see, like you said, a time delay on these games, and it is not going to be Mario and Zelda, not right, not even in the next few years, period. But you're not going to see it over. You're not going to see it in the next few years. What you're going to see is a slow trickle-down effect of, like I said, those third parties that are exclusive to the consoles. They're going to kind of you know, do that for the next couple of years, play buddy-buddy nice. Mm-hmm. And then depending on the environment, I think we might start to see cross-bleeding with like their Halos and maybe like Metroids, something like that, Kid Icarus, um, Kirby's Adventure. I don't think you'll, like you said, I don't think we'll ever see the biggest dogs but on the other side of that, now that I just say that out loud, Halo kind of is the biggest dog that Microsoft has. So what would Microsoft have to trade in this kind of like, you know, rub my back, rub your back, we work together, we, we trade titles, your console's got its own exclusives, ours has ours, but mutually together we got like a lot of things going on. I don't... I don't know how that would work, really. Well, see, when, I, when, when I was first thinking about it, I was like, well, you can trade your third-party exclusives back and forth, but, they, I mean, that third-party games go back and forth all the time. All the time. It doesn't so really matter. So it doesn't mean really anything. matter. But I, I feel like in this lifetime, we won't see companies going across to that degree. Like, you talk to Nintendo, they're a, they've been around forever. I, I don't see them changing to be like, oh, yeah, sure, we can work together or merge to any degree that it would it would really matter i mean you're talking about the way lesser titles Mm -hmm. i feel like what you're saying is oh yeah eventually they'll just be hand in hand going at it even though you did specifically say not your big dogs but i don't know i just feel like it, it in this world you can't do that you've worked so hard to build your microsoft brand your nintendo brand these are, you know, you license your stuff out to other developers, sure, but they're, you're, they're in this box, and they don't do this, that, or the other thing with it, or anything they try has to get approved. So I don't see anybody, like, like this, is my whole, this is my stuff. 
you can't take and touch my stuff without my express permission. You know what I'm saying? But, I don't know. But like, the thing is, we're all moving towards a PC world. And every console generation gets closer to just being a PC. Hmm. So basically, you're just being, as console players are generally viewed as idiots who know nothing about, you know, tech. So that's why you go buy a console, because it's just a box. It magically works. I, put, I push the button and I play, you know what hmm. I mean? But it's getting so advanced that these are just PCs. So I feel like there's going to come a time, and we're moving towards it, where the reason you're buying an Xbox or the reason you're buying the PlayStation or the Nintendo is going to be for its side stuff, its fun things, like how its menus work, how its his store operates, any kind of fun exclusives. Like Nintendo obviously will always have, hey, you remember Nintendo games? You remember this? We can hand these out. If you're only on the Nintendo PC... You get to have all these fun little Super Nintendo games and things at your disposal. And look at our fun menus and Mario points and this and that. Well, if you're on PlayStation, <laughs> guess what? You know, we got this over here and this over here. And look at our menus and look how fast, look how speedy our gameplay is or this or that. Because, I mean, obviously you're going to have the different, you know, uh, graphics cards in there, the different SSD drives, da 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 so and so, solid state drives. I think it's going to move to a point where games are played across all three platforms the same, and it's only the only difference is going to be the speeds and the toys and the fun things and the goofy crap. Now see, I, I, could, I could get on your, your, your tertiary level games getting shared across that kind of handshaking. This will never happen. This is even more out, off the deep end. If you've worked this hard to establish your Sony brand, you will never not have Sony exclusive games. You will never not have Microsoft exclusive games. You will never just, oh, look, we, you, Nintendo will never stop making games. And if the Nintendo no. makes games, they will be exclusive games to Nintendo platforms. Like, I, I, I get what you're saying in theory, but like all this, all, you know, like when you talk about stadio or any of these other streaming services or steam or stuff it's never first party games it's always oh it's the third parties who make it for all things and all everywheres Mm -hmm. like stadia is not getting true stadia is not getting mario odyssey stadia is not getting persona 5 stadia is not getting well halo is different because that's on pc already so Uh that's that's an iffy iffy but I, i i can't see that happening because if 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 it happened it would mean that all the tradition and work and build up for all these years for all three of those companies they just went okay it's over now they'll mm-hmm. they, people will fight and scratch tooth and nail and since they're companies they can they can bite and they can scratch really hard to keep their stuff well and you know of course i'm playing devil's advocate mostly because i don't think the first party stuff's ever going to leave right but what i'm getting at in a broader sense i guess is this can't continue like three separate systems with three different completely system, three different complete systems, in which every developer has to do years worth of work to transfer over and be able to play. Because it's the third parties who mostly suffer here, because mm-hmm. they have to make choices or they have to do triple the amount of work to make their games available on each and every system for each and everything. Whereas, like, that's the beauty of it. When you develop for PC, hey, guess what? That's it. You develop for PC, mm-hmm. and everybody with every dang build under the sun. As long as they keep up, can play it. Whereas with these consoles, it's all oh, so, oh no, sorry, we are using the Dolphin Ben 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 Nine this and that. Can't can't use that with us. And then you know Xbox, oh sorry, we got the premium Jet Jet Crozos. You can't do that. And then the third party's like, oh my God, you guys. I I feel like we're getting that point with this crossplay thing going on and everything else moving where it's play nice, at least with everything. Besides the first parties, because I think you're right. I mean, it's I just play Devil's Advocate for fun. Mm. You're not gonna see Mario go anywhere else. I just like to dream, you know, that maybe it could happen. It, but, but I feel like it's got to change, and we've got to get some kind of uh, solidarity going, so that way the developers can make these games cheaper, faster, and be able to pop them wherever they want them. If they want to be exclusive, that's fine. But if they don't. You know, this gives them an opportunity to go, okay, bam, 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 bam. There you go. Like, I, I definitely get what you're saying, but I think this just goes, you know, even if it's just the, you know, the interior hardware of each console, each company, each of the big three has such, I don't know the word for it other than like pride. Like, you would never 
do something that's you would never do the exact same thing as the other two. You would always have your own exclusive builds of this. And I don't think that will ever go away. So granted, yes, it would be nicer for third parties or especially like indie developers to just be like, oh, look, everything's the same. So just all I have to do is I can be a, a team of one guy and release one game once and it's out on everything. But I just don't, I just don't, I can't see that happening ever. But see, that's the thing that kills me is because it could, and they could still keep a unique, they could make the box obviously look completely different. Their graphics card could be completely different. You know, their solid state drive, whatever one they're using can be completely different. It just has to be the main board that has to be somewhat the same because, like I said, again, PCs, people got a different graphics card all over the sun. And it doesn't require them to build differently at all. They just go out, we're building to this minimum spec here, and as long as it does that, you can play. But if you think well, if you think about it too, if everybody's on the same type of deal, like a PC, mm-hmm. you can crack and hack PC stuff like nobody's business. Like nobody's business. Whereas That's you true. have to get like in depth and super work at any of the consoles, which when you're talking about games and online play, which and cross platform play especially, well, if I got a hacked PS4 and it's interacting directly with all the other, you know, all the other systems, that's. I think the online area is where that starts to get into trouble. If everything's the same, then you can manipulate everything with the same degree of ease. You know, I don't know. Yeah. So basically, what you're getting at is you think in the in the short term and long term. The best we're going to see is them just playing nice and goofing off with one another. Yeah, I feel like... And they're oh, still going to have their wars and their bickering and their bannering. And and we're still going to have to buy, obviously, one or all three of the consoles to play most of the titles that you respectively want to play on those three titles. Realistically, I think, yes. I mean, it would be nice, <laughs> sure, in a, in a pie-in-the-sky utopia world. I just can't see it happening. But nobody's really up for this anymore. Here's the problem. You just saw it with Xbox and the PlayStation. They just released two consoles in, in the, in the six-year span. Mm. That's not acceptable. You see, how long can you do that for? I don't think the average gamer is going to be down with going, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm on board PlayStation 5, two and a half, three years later. It's PlayStation 5.5 now. Then three years after that, well, PlayStation 5.6, and then we're going to do PlayStation 6. Aww. Well, you did hear that when <laughs> Xbox One X and PS4 Pro were announced, but what do you hear now? You only hear that people are playing it in HDR and 4K resolution on their giant TVs with Xbox One X and PS4 Pro. You never hear uh-huh. of us, the regular people, because we're not even the regular people anymore. The regular people upgraded. Nolan upgraded, for God's sakes. He's mm-hmm. he's the. I mean, I wouldn't say he's like a non-gamer, but... He's not as he doesn't do freaking game and podcast, no. and we don't even do it. So I, I get I get what you're saying, but I think it's just like with any new upgrade or any new tech, or you know, oh man, this phone's only been out a year, and now they got a new phone. Oh well, I bought it, even though I was mad about it. It's gonna happen. Oh. It's just it's you get the momentary oh, outrage, and then people will just accept it, just like with every outrage thing. I'm so outraged. Oh well, I stopped caring, and now I just got the thing. But I don't get the thing. That's the, I don't. I don't accept this reality, Matt. They cannot sit here and keep producing. Just because it doesn't work for you doesn't boxes. mean it doesn't work monetarily for this giant world. If they were going to switch in. it, if they were going to switch it to where you could replace pieces of your box, mm-hmm. no, I, I, I definitely get that. it. I would love that for like too. Like a part of the cost. So yeah. it's like, hey, you got a PlayStation Five, and then two or three years down the road, they go, hey, PlayStation Five Point Five, replace this part right here that you can knock out pop in the new one that we're charging one hundred seventy nine and ninety nine for, whatever mm-hmm. the price is, and you're on board. Instead of going, hey, here's a whole other box that's a little more powerful and has a little more of this and a little more of that for an- another $500. But if you pay them $500, they get $500. Mm-hmm. What do you do with your old one? You sell it to GameStop, and they give you some money, but you still give the company $500 because you buy it new mm-hmm. from GameStop. If you sell a two hundred dollar upgrade, that's a lot. That's three hundred dollars less than a five hundred dollar new console. So it's, I get it. I agree. No, I would love no. to pop up that <laughs> that right quadrant there, my PS4, and put the new PS4 upgrade chip in, or you know whatever it is, put in the new module, slot it into the slot, and be good to go. But 
this company's with money, man. You can't and so you can't tell them to to do it nicer for cheaper to make it easier for us. They're gonna go, but dude, you could pay six hundred dollars right now, and you could buy a Sony Bravia eighty inch HDR four K eight K nineteen K. Yeah, but the cost for them though is they don't really make a lot of money off the consoles. It's the games that they make the money off. That's of. true. The consoles they generally break even on, sometimes lose money on. Mm. So I, I just feel like it would be beneficial for them to, instead of breaking even, to get the titles, find a cheaper way to upgrade their systems. And then by doing so, obviously, it provides us a cheaper way to purchase said upgrades. And then we keep moving forward, especially with the Google Stadia coming into play. If it doesn't bomb and become a complete failure, which is altogether possible mm. because, of course, Google's its own worst enemy. And on top of that, internet sucks in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll see. They they swear that they've got the this Huckleberry internet I have is going to be able to play games no problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, I still am very skeptical of that. But if it takes off, what then? I mean, imagine a world in which a Stadia is successful and you can just buy this game, play it on any device, anywhere you want to. No big, no huss, no fuss, no buying this five hundred dollars stupid box. You just pay the yearly subscription fee and buy the games, obviously, and away you go. And, and I, well, how do you react? You know, I get you. I, I see what you're saying, but you're not going to play Uncharted on your Stadia. You're not going to play Mario Odyssey on your Stadia. You're not going to play Gears no. of War and Halo on well, the Stadia. And then it comes back to the beginning. So it's, it's, how, it's, you, those first party exclusives, and that's that it. What they're going to keep hoarding to try to keep people on a console. Because even when I was like, oh man, well, you remember. Well, what am I going to do for the next generation? Which system am I going to go with? I'll probably go with PC. No, uh, PS4 right there because they have the exclusives that I need. Or mm -hmm. not need, you know what I mean. As a gamer, yeah, I need to play, play them. So yeah. it it will always be that way. It would be nice to all change right. all these things. I don't think it's going to happen, Eric. I'm, well, I'm sorry to be the guy. Man. I don't want to be that guy the all the time. The next console, but. I think the next time we're going to start to see smaller iterations. I really do. I, th I think it's going to happen. I was playing Devil Advocate for the first party stuff. I don't think those are going to move over, mm -hmm. but I do see cross play, cross save becoming yeah. a absolute norm across the board. That I 100% agree with. Yeah, and then I see. But that's not that's Microsoft not scandalous, so it's not a good cool no. topic to talk about. Yeah, exactly. And I see Microsoft and Nintendo sticking it out for a while, but yeah. I do worry about them being friend buddy buddy forever. I think it's right now to, of course, try to get both of them up a little bit better mm -hmm. in the eyeball view of where PlayStation's at, and maybe to scare PlayStation into, you know, into at least jumping on the crossplay you know, type nice thing. Nice a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think when the when Project Scarlet or the Xbox, whatever they call it, comes out, that's going to be the hey, we got our our big jump up. Now we don't. I mean, they'll still play nice, but I don't think it, it'll be a it'll be a major thinking point. You know. I understand your point, man. I get it. I hope you're wrong, and I hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, time will tell. And the big, the big, I think, biggest thing we're gonna have to look at is how successful PlayStation is mm -hmm. in the next coming, you know, console war in quotation marks. Because if Sony stays on top and they keep ahead, mm -hmm. I think you're gonna see a huge play nice between nintendo and microsoft yeah. but then you're going to see playstation just laugh and get farther and farther ahead and not care and then we're not going to get that future at all because they're going to see that money is on the table and it's okay and nothing has to be changed Th that's 100 percent it if you're the lead dog and you don't have to make any concessions or play nice why would you ever you can just sit there exactly. and keep breaking that money in so you have to hope that the Stadia does a good job, gets in there, and actually becomes a, a great side system to have, much like the Switch is. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to hope that between Microsoft and Nintendo sharing some of their titles and their indies, etc., and going back and forth with one another, that gets people buying the Xbox a lot more and the Switch a lot more mm -hmm. because then they're starting to get some of the side stuff from either or. Yep. And then Sony's pocketbook starts to hurt. And then they go, oh, okay, hang on, guys, you know. And then they come in, and mm -hmm. everybody starts making deals and hustling. And then bada bing, bada boom, you get everybody. Maybe not the genuine future of happiness, mm -hmm. where everything's all, hey, you can play anywhere you want. All the things are the same. But at least to a point where, besides your first party exclusives, those only five or six titles, everything's everywhere. Everything's cross play. Mm -hmm. There you go. I get. I think that's the dream I hope for, along with the 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 side upgrades instead of the full consoles mm -hmm. 
but you know, I well, I guess we'll just watch and see. It'll probably be Matt's bleak future of nothing changing, nothing getting fixed and or better. Well, okay. well, you say that, but still, <laughs> we have amazing games now. We have experiences we've never had before in our entire lives. So even if things stay the same, we're still going to get amazing new experiences that you, we couldn't even dream of right now in the future. So I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to say, regardless of anything, I hope all the companies succeed. I would love to see Stadia succeed, even if it's you know on a smaller, lower level, or if it gets blowing up big, because that sounds awesome. I'd love to take my laptop with me, plug a controller into it, and then play... I, all I can think of are first-party games. I love to play Assassin's Creed just on the go with this uh-huh. dumpy laptop I just use for audio recording. That'd be amazing. So I, I hope it would be. I hope all the companies do well because then it just leads to more unique experiences, whether it's gameplay or hardware or this or that or exclusive games. I just want everybody to do great and have a good time and me to be able to enjoy all the things. That's all I want. All right, everybody. Well, there you go. A little back and forth. <laughs> we all both hope for the same happy future. Just think it'll come about in different ways. That's exactly it. That's what right. do you all think, huh? You know, what are your opinions? Do you think we're all going to play nice in the future? Do you think it's going to become a crazy corporate war in which Terminators are going to come down and kill everybody and we're not going to have nice things? Let us know, because I'm interested. <laughs> and we'll let you know how to let us know in the wrap-up coming up next. Imposters Wrap-Up. So if you guys want to let us know your answers to any of those questions, if you want to say that we're both stupid and you know exactly how the future of gaming is going to come out, and if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, any kind of feedback at all, send it to us via email at info at thirdshift.me, tweet it at us at thirdshiftme, and find us on Facebook under Third Shift. Indeed, you can find us over there. You can also find us over on that Patreon. If you like what you hear, like what we're up to, want to support us, considering her, consider heading over there and throwing us $1, $2, $3, $5, Hey, anything and everything, we treat it just like a tip jar. It'd be awesome. It'd help us keep the lights on over here. Maybe even consider giving us that $1 million because, you know what, we'll open up a food line. We'll have babies in jars. We'll have, uh, what else we have? We have we have something else we've added to it, Matt. Damn it, we've I added can't, something I else to the aisles. It was. it was the best thing ever. Cool. Duh. We're going to add the patented cold cocks That's tablets it. and... <laughs> that was it. Oh god! I can't even say it with a straight face, man. Wasn't there also? Cold we also have like a bakery or something. You to <laughs> <laughs> Consider heading over there, throwing us a tip, throwing us something if you can. If you can't, that's okay too. You know what? You can support us in all sorts of other ways, like on the Twitch. You can follow, subscribe on the Twitter. You can give us the face, Facebook likes, the Twitter thumbs ups, all that good stuff. You can give us mailbag questions, any other thing. It all helps us out, keeps us motivated, keeps us wanting to come back and hang out with all of you. Absolutely. And, of course, this podcast drops every two weeks on Tuesday. So we'll be back in your rear holes on the 3rd of September. Hey, day after Labor Day. It's going to be a great day. We're going to be chilling out, relaxing and maxing. It's going to be a good time. And you can find that episode on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Podbean, on Spotify, and on YouTube. And as I always say, if you like what we're doing and you'd like to help us out, please give us a like, a rating, a review, a comment, a subscription, any kind of good thing on any of those good services, because it does help us out. And we really do appreciate it. We do indeed, and a couple people came over there and gave us some of them five-star ratings, even a four-star rating. We don't you know, prefer, you know, prefer those five stars, but we do appreciate all of you heading over there and throwing us some ratings. True. It helps us out, gets us higher up on the metrics. You've heard it all before in a million other podcasts, but it's very true. It does do that. It does help. So if you got five seconds that you can spare for us, please do so. If Thank you got you so five much. seconds, we can get five stars. Bam. Bam! You did it, Matt. Good job. With that, we're going to get out of here. You know what to do, Mr. Matt. Don't forget to save.